Okay, welcome everybody. We'll call this meeting to order. This is the Standing Committee on Priorities and Planning. And uh, for the record, I am the acting chair today and happy to do so. Uh, and to kick us off, uh, I'll ask Ms. Green to lead us in her prayer. Thank you. We need to serve our territory to use our resources wisely and well, to represent all members of our communities fairly, to make decisions that promote the common good. We recognize our responsibility to the past and the future, and the rights and needs of both individuals and communities. As trusted public servants, we seek blessings on our deliberations and on our efforts here today. May we act wisely and well. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Green. Committee, we have an agenda before us, review and adoption of the agenda. We have a single item on the agenda today, but prior to getting to that, uh, do, does any member have to declare conflict of interest in the matter before us today? Seeing none. The item we have is a public briefing on the proposed public engagement plan on legalization of cannabis, and that is with the Honorable uh, Lou Siebert, Minister of Justice. And prior to turning it over to the minister, I will go around and ask MLAs to introduce themselves for the record. And I'll start over here on my left. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Shane Thompson, uh, Hindi. Danny McNeely, Statue Region. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Michael Madley, Detroit. Julie Green, Yellow Knife Center. Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. RJ Simpson, Haverford North. And I'm Corey Van Fine, MLA for Yellowknife North, and we also have with us today from the Research Department, Mr. Lee Salick, and from the Clerk's Office, uh, Mr. Michael Ball. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Minister Siebert, for opening comments and introducing of your staff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm pleased to be here to talk to you uh, today about the upcoming public engagement on the legalization and regulation of uh, cannabis. I'm joined here today by Mark Aiken to my right, uh, Assistant Deputy Minister, Attorney General with the Department of Justice, and uh, to my left, uh, Kelly Bluck, uh, Director of Fiscal Policy for the Department of Finance, who both serve on the Intergovernmental Legalization and Regulation Working Group. Behind us, I would also like to introduce a number of members of the Working Group, including Isabel Goche, Manager, Indigenous Affairs for Executive and Indigenous Affairs, Emily Ingerfield, Manager, Policy and Planning for the Department of Justice. Raven uh, Bettingfield, Senior Policy Officer with the Department of Health and Social Services. And Megan Burt, Senior Policy Analyst with the Department of Infrastructure. Mr. Chair, as members know, on April 13, 2017, the Government of Canada introduced its proposed Cannabis, Cannabis Act in uh, in Parliament, the Act sets out a national framework for legalizing, regulating, and restricting access to cannabis. Officials in uh, provinces and territories have been working with the federal government for just over a year now to determine what steps are required to ensure we are prepared for implementation. To date, this has included uh, 23 teleconference meetings with the FPT Senior Officials Working Group on Cannabis Legalization and Regulation and one face-to-face uh, -face meeting in Ottawa. Provinces and territories have recently begun to hold additional teleconferences without federal participation to explore issues that may have implications particular to the jurisdictions. NWT officials have participated in these meetings, and in addition, our officials have also initiated a number of one-on-one -on -one exchanges with the Federal Cannabis Secretariat to seek information and advice on issues of specific interest to the NWT. Within the GNWT, the Interdepartmental inter, inter Cannabis Legalization and Regulation Working Group first met on April, August 2nd, 2016. It has convened six times to discuss the broad range of policy options that must be considered as we prepare for the upcoming public engagement. The group has recently recommended the guiding principles that will inform that engagement process, and they have prepared a draft public engagement document and supporting materials. All of this work to date has been necessary 
and it has allowed NWT officials to develop the knowledge and information base required to appropriately engage with NWT residents on complex issues related to the legalization of cannabis. Following the public engagement, we will be in a position to develop territorial legislation and to make decisions on a range of policy and operational matters necessary for implementation. As I noted in the House, provincial and territorial governments will be able to decide how certain matters are approached within their jurisdiction. These include regulating how cannabis is distributed and sold in the NWT, setting boundaries around minimum, minimum age and public use, developing ongoing education and awareness campaigns, and establishing drug impaired driving and workplace impairment policies. The GNWT is committed to having effective measures in place to protect the health and safety of our residents and communities. Our government wants to make sure that our plans take the views and opinions of NWT residents into account while still complying with federal requirements. Based on the work completed to date, we have developed the proposed principles to guide GNWT decisions related to the legalization of cannabis. The public engagement materials will use the principles as a launching pad to obtain the views of our residents on a range of policy and operational questions. We know the time is right, is tight rather, and we intend to launch the public engagement by the end of this month. Mr. Chair, I look forward to hearing from Northerners on this subject. I am sure that we will continue to have many interesting discussions about how to regulate cannabis as specific plans and legislation are developed and brought forward for consideration over the fall and winter. I would now like to ask Mark Aiken to take us through the presentation, after which I look forward to discussing any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. At this time, I'll turn it over to Mr. Aiken. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll start with slide two. On April 13, as you heard from the Minister, the federal government introduced two large bills. The proposed Cannabis Act provides for the licensing and regulation of the legal cannabis supply chain, including production and manufacture, and it acknowledges the provincial and territorial role in regulating the sale of cannabis within each jurisdiction. The second bill amends the criminal code to address criminal sanctions for drug-impaired driving and significantly reforms the general legislative regime applicable to impaired driving. Slide three. Part four of the Cannabis Act establishes boundaries on the legislation that could be enacted by the provinces and territories with the goal of achieving coherence and consistency across Canada in the areas of product sale, youth access, record creep keeping across the legal supply chain, and preventing diversion to the illegal market. Individuals who are authorized to perform functions under the provincial and territorial regime may safely conduct those activities even if they are inconsistent with the provision of the Cannabis Act. For an example, an individual who is authorized to sell cannabis may possess more than the individual carry limit. The federal government has made it very clear that legalization of cannabis will unfold at the same time across Canada and has provided a backstop mechanism should any jurisdiction be unable to establish its own retail framework before the federal legislation comes into force. It is expected that individuals would be able to order cannabis through the mail should this be the case. The territorial government is committed to doing the work necessary to ensure we have a made in the NWT regime already in place to avoid this scenario, as there are concerns associated with the direct mail order system operated from outside the NWT, including how it would, would restrict access to youth. <coughs> Slide four. The interdepartmental working group proposed these eight principles to guide both the upcoming public engagement and the legislative policy development work that will follow. These principles were informed by the original discussion paper that launched the federal public engagement process, by the report of the federally appointed Task Force on Cannabis Legalization and Regulation, by the discussions in the ongoing FPT process, 
and by our own appreciation of concerns and social realities in the NWT. We think these principles will provide an appropriate grounding for the upcoming public engagement. Slide 5. It is no secret that the NWT faces particular challenges in addressing addictions and abuse of alcohol and drugs. We have the second youngest population in the country, and nearly half of our Aboriginal residents are under the age of 25. The use of tobacco, alcohol, and cannabis in the NWT is notably higher than the national average. Given that context, the public engagements will seek the views of NWT residents on possibly increasing the minimum age for cannabis consumption and reducing the federal carry and home grow limits. We do not want to suggest that these issues are completely ours to determine. Federal officials have been very clear that provincial and territorial restrictions cannot undermine or frustrate the federal purpose underlying the Cannabis Act. So for instance, the NABT could probably reduce the carry limit from 30 to 25 grams, but it is unlikely that we could drop it to 5 grams. NABT officials have asked that these matters be discussed in the FPT forum, and we have also scheduled a bilateral discussion with federal officials in the very near future to seek their views on the parameters of the provincial and territorial room to adjust the federal thresholds. Slide 6. The most pressing legislative and operational challenge facing the NWT, and indeed each province and territory, is how to establish a secure, effective, and accessible regime for the distribution and sale of cannabis. In the NWT, we face particular logistical challenges relating to the distribution of much of our population in small, remote communities, many of which do not have permanent road access. Given the already higher than average use of both alcohol and cannabis in our population, the health and safety risks associated with co-use are particularly acute. It can be expected that co-use of substances will increase once legalization has occurred. This concern will have to be addressed in the NWT scheme for retail sale and in our public education efforts. We also recognize that communities and Aboriginal governments will legitimately want to have authority to regulate cannabis in, their, in the communities, consistent with the NWT regime for liquor. This is another area in which we have been bilaterally engaging federal officials. We are confident that they understand our circumstances and we look forward to receiving their views in the near future. Our interest in providing for local option regimes may be fairly unique in Canada, but in other areas we expect the NBT legislation and policy will be consistent with a general Canadian standard. We suspect we will see considerable similarity in the approaches taken across Canada to address issues such as drug impaired driving, workplace safety, and the public smoking of cannabis. Slide 7. As mentioned earlier, developing a framework for the retail sale of cannabis will likely be the most significant task we face going forward. It is not just a matter of providing an appropriate legislative foundation. There will also be very significant logistical challenges relating to establishing an appropriate supply chain for cannabis. This includes building a secure system that starts with buying product from licensed producers and extends through to the ultimate sale to NWT consumers. We will be very interested in hearing what emerges from the public engagement on this issue. Do residents favor a system that operates in tandem with the Liquor Commission distribution of alcohol, which features strict regulation and oversight of the contractors who operate the storefront points of sale? Or should there be a wider distribution of retailers consistent with the model for tobacco sales? We cannot prejudge the engagement, of course, but it seems reasonable to assume that there would be limited support for a model that would see the NWT vacate the field, leaving only the federal mail order last resort approach for the service of our residents. Slide 8. Members and the public have heard about the upcoming public engagement in the statement of the Minister delivered in the House. We hope to launch the internet-based component of the engagement by the end of this month. 
and to follow up with visits to regional centres and representative small communities in September. There is a great deal of public interest in issues surrounding the legalization of cannabis, and we anticipate that our residents will have a lot to say. The What We Heard report will conclude the public engagement process, and it should be both informative and interesting. Our ninth and final slide. When we look at the dates on this chart, it is easy to feel overwhelmed. There is so much work to do for officials, for ministers, for MLAs, and for communities. But the NWT has been faced with unforgiving deadlines for major tasks before. Division and devolution spring to mind. And we got it done then, and we should have every confidence that we will get it done now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aiken, for the presentation. Committee, I'll turn it over to you now for comments, questions, concerns. Comments, questions, concerns from committee. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the presentation. On slide 8, it talks about internet-based dialogue. Um, can we just get a little bit more information about what that is going to be and how soon it's going to be launched? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Aitken. Ms. Buck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Internet-based dialogue is going to be a, a set of pamphlets of uh, information and then a series of questions to guide the conversation. And then what people can do is can either submit in via email or submit right. We're hoping that we can have a form where you can submit your comments into or particular questions right into the form itself. And it will be not unlike the budget dialogues that we had several years ago. Thank you. Ms. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So um, uh, is there a launch date that's been identified for that? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Buck. Apparently, uh, thank you. Uh, Minister Siebert. Thank you. Uh, we're aiming for the end of, the, uh, end of June. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Um, I have one other, if I could, Mr. Chair. The um, letter from the, the minister um, in the, it identifies the, the draft principles as set out on the, the, um, the slides in the presentation, but it said the draft principles include, uh, and then it lists them. Are, are there other draft principles that are being developed, or is this it? Uh, just whenever the word include is used, it sort of gives the impression that there might be something else coming. So thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Siever. Yes, um, those are the principles that we have identified, and we're not thinking of adding to this list at this point. Thank you. Next, I have Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My uh, question is related to slide number four. It seems that we uh, we can all agree that the legislation is going to proceed to move ahead on this cannabis legislation. So therefore, we in the small communities or in the small remote areas take into consideration, okay, now we're moving ahead. Now we've got to engage in consultation. So I'm glad to hear that you have a time frame on that and you're looking at the regulatory legislation side of this piece of uh, legislation that's going to happen. So my, my question is, is in the workplace on the safety side of the impairment, uh, if you look at, um, <clears throat> if you look at uh, the uh, item number four on page four, protect workers and the public from drug impairment in the workplace. Have, have you identified or is there supporting evidence on the scientific side of determining the level of impairment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Siebert. Thank you. Perhaps I could have Mr. Aiken respond to that question. Thank you. Mr. Aiken. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it, it is a very good question. Um, the, there are problems with the 
with, with the science relating to how you test for drug impairment. Um, the Department of Infrastructure put on a presentation just this week where we brought up experts uh, in, in the testing of drug impairment. And what they say is, is that a, a positive test from a saliva-based device does not mean that a person is actually impaired, but a person could pass a saliva-based test because they smoked marijuana some period of time ago and be impaired at that moment. So the, the testing is only going to be one indicator that will be used in the, in the issue of drug-impaired driving. In terms of drug impairment in the workplace, which the member relates to, that is a problem in Canada now. There have been fatalities associated with that in the NWT and across this, this country. And it is something that the Workers' Compensation and Safety Commission is taking very seriously. There are separate forums that they are engaged with and as to how they are going to deal with drug impairment, which is already is a problem, but they anticipate that it will be a more significant problem once legalization occurs. Thank you. Thank you. Further, Mr. McNeely? Th thank you, Mr. Chair. I would imagine this will probably <clears throat> come up a, a number of times for the next year. So my, my, my next question is that, um, sure, this government along with others have workplace projects and uh, people on our staff at the workplace site. So given that, would there be legislation and working in conjunction with the uh, Workers Commission on, on having the freedom of the workplace site uh, to initiate their own policy? Let's say the private company building a home, could they, um, is there some discussions going on the workplace site being, uh, addressing their own on-site policy for cannabis? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Aiken. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I don't know what discussions have taken place in that, in that particular forum relating to the Workers' Safety and Compensation Commissions across Canada. Um, Members may have heard the news just this past week about how some large-scale operators, including the Toronto Transit Commission, have asked for the ability to have drug testing in the workforce due to events that have occurred in the workplace. So this is obviously an issue that is it's much larger than just the legalization of cannabis, actually, because it relates to, to questions that are arising now and to other drugs as well. So I don't think we've heard the last of that particular issue. Thank you. Thank you. Further, Mr. McNeely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My, my last question on the subject here. We can, we can say today that alcohol is, is, is a legal product, and so is legalizing cannabis. And on, on the work site, there is alcohol policies protecting the, uh, the the average worker or the, or the worker on site. So, would you look into having a policy uh, legislation to address the work site cannabis policy on uh, by by the private sector? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Aiken. Thank you. We we do anticipate that the worker safety and. Uh, Compensation Commission will be introducing, will develop both policies and possibly regulatory amendments to deal with with, uh, with drug impairment in the workplace. Um, that is something we anticipate and we think it will be done in the course of this next year. Thank you. Thank you. Next I have Mr. Nadley. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on page four, in terms of the principles, it gives a a broad range of the use of marijuana, but it doesn't make any spe specific reference to medical marijuana. Is there a reason why it, it's not a reference? Is it because there's the presumption that the federal uh, legislation takes precedence in terms of how it's been used across Canada? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Aiken. Thank you. Um, the reason it's not mentioned is because Canada has made the decision that the medical marijuana regime will continue uh, beyond July 2018. So we will have we will have a recreational marijuana 
system, uh, which has been legalized, and the existing medical marijuana regime, which is legal, will continue. Thank you. Thank you. Further, Mr. Nadley? Nothing further. Next, I have Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my first question is with regards to on page six on the slide says some about uh, restrictions or prohibition within these communities. What is the talk with the federal government on this issue? Where are we at this present stage? Because a number of our communities do not allow alcohol in the community, and I'm going to assume that they don't allow won't allow cannabis in there as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Siebert. Well, I think that's one of the things we want to hear about during the public engagement. Um, uh, one of the, the problems is going to be is that uh, if the system is unduly complex and there's vast differences between different communities, particularly if they're close together, uh, enforcement of a, a prohibition may be uh, difficult. But we are going out to uh, regional centers and also to small communities, so we're expecting to hear informed comment uh, on that exact issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Thompson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm actually looking at conversation with the federal government. Has the department, the government, gone to the federal government and said, hey, this is a potential that could happen in the, our Northwest Territories? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Siebert? Perhaps uh, Mr. Aiken could uh, assist with that question. Thank you. Mr. Aiken. Thank you. Uh, and the answer is yes, we have. Um, it started when the, the task force was consulting with three territories, and we gave, provided the task force with considerable information about the liquor prohibition and restriction regime we have in Northwest Territories. And we expected, we, we stated we anticipated there would be considerable interest in having a similar regime for our communities. Um, in the last, probably, within the last month or last six weeks, we had a bilateral meeting with officials from the, from the Federal Cannabis Secretariat, specifically in relation to uh, local prohibition and restriction regimes and what we could do for cannabis. We provided them with information about the communities in Northwest Territories that have liquor prohibition and restriction regimes. We also provided information about how um, enforcement is conducted now um, we received an indication from Canada last week that we could expect to hear this week from them as to what their views are of the materials we've provided to them. We haven't received that, uh, that information from them yet. We actually have another meeting with the Federal Secretariat, another bilateral meeting, I should say, with the Federal Secretary, coming up later this week. It's mainly to deal, that meeting is mainly to deal with the issue I alluded to in the presentation about how far can you move thresholds up or down? But we're also expecting to deal with the local options issue in the course of that teleconference. Thank you. Thank you. Further, Mr. Thompson? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank Mr. Aiken for that answer. I guess I'm hoping uh, that the minister will get that information out to us, especially the communities that have restrictions and prohibition in there so we can get that information too. Um, my other next question is in regards to the equipment. Uh, for drug and parent. I've read a number of articles, and it's a huge cost. It's going to be a huge cost. It's going to be different, and as I think Mr. Aiken talked about, you know, it's, just a, it's not a slab of test. It's a number of things. So who is going to be covering these costs for the RCMP to be fully equipped to do these tests? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Seaver. Well, I imagine that it will be, uh, will be, covering our 70% of that cost, as we generally do with uh, our CMP costs. So if new equipment is needed or new cars are needed or whatever is needed, um, we are responsible for part of that cost, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Further, Mr. Thompson? I can be put back on the list. i got about three or four more. Mr. Can't put you back on the list. Thank you. Next, I have Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess two things I wanted to pursue. One is... Um, this looks like it's going to cross a number of departments, and then we've heard very little, if anything, about tax revenue. So uh, the, the, are we going to get, like, one bill that's going to come out of this that's going to have, make uh, consequential changes to, you know, the, uh, I don't know, 
tax legislation um, maybe have to regulate this as a new controlled substance or something and possibly WSCC uh, Act changes or uh, how's this going to roll out once the consultation stuff is finished and uh, I'm just trying to figure out what kind of a bill we're going to get uh, uh, coming out of this. Thanks Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Siebert. Thank you, Mr. Aiken. Uh, thank you. Um, um, for the greatest part of my career, I was a legislative counsel, so I think a lot about bills, and uh, and some of the, and this is by no means determined in, in any way, but uh, the 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 public engagement will be followed by a what we heard document. After that, we're going to have to work very quickly on legislative proposals that will deal with a number of things, including retail sale will be the largest item by far, is how we regulate supply chain and retail sale. We'll also be dealing with with, uh, with um, drug impaired driving, probably amendments to the Motor Vehicles Act, I would suspect. Um, there would be possibility of a small amendment to the Territorial Parks Act to give regulatory authority to regulate cannabis use in parks consistent with what we have for, for alcohol now. Um, I have a feeling I'm, I'm forgetting something. So what I would envisage would be, would be that different departments would be working on their individual legislative initiatives once the legislative proposals are approved. But I, w I would hope that we're in a position to have an omnibus integrated bill um, similar to what, what, what Canada did with the Cannabis Act, and you'll, you'll, you'll recall that they amended a large number of other statutes associated with, 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 with marijuana and cannabis. So that's how I think it will roll out. Um, whatever we do, we have to ensure it's, it's enacted by June. Um, since I'm talking about this, perhaps I can introduce one further challenge we're going to be facing because normally we have a, a, a legislative regime where we, we enact the statute much like we did with the Liquor Act in 2007. Then we take a period of time, we develop regulations under that act, then we bring the regulations and the act into force at the same time. This time, we have to ensure that the legislative regime is complete. So we have to have the statute ready, the bill ready, and as soon as that drafting work is done, the drafters will be turning to doing regulations that will have to also be prepared at the same time so that when we bring the act into force, the regulations that are critically necessary under that act can also be brought into force. Thanks. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly? Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I do appreciate the answer. Uh, to me, it looks like there's some thought quite a bit of thought that's actually gone into this already, which is uh, reassuring. Um, I want to ask, though, about taxation. The, the, there's nothing in here whatsoever around ta the issue of taxation. Is that going to be part of the public engagement, and how are we going to regulate this in terms of taxation? There's nothing in here about that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And, and you know, I guess I'm wondering, are we going to consider targeting these revenues? towards some of these purposes. I know governments hate to do that with taxes, but um, th there's obviously going to be some additional costs for us in implementing all of this. So uh, anyways, where's the discussion going to take place around taxation? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Block. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The taxation issue really has to wait until we talk to, uh, to the public and decide what the model is going to be that you're going to actually, um, uh, we're actually going to do for distribution. For example, if we are going a liquor commission type model, the answer to your taxation issue is quite simple, it's the markup. But if we are going to do another type of model, then what we really want to be doing is um, discussing more with the federal and provincial jurisdictions because the idea of the taxation is not to raise revenue in this particular instance. We have to think of this as more a case of the purpose of the um, cannabis legalization is partly to destroy the black market if we can. So the taxation also has to be paramount to not taxing too high so that you will encourage to keep the black market and not taxing too low that um, there is an incentive to 
to consume more cannabis than we actually want people to do and because we don't want them to consume it at all so with that there is a very good possibility that we would want to harmonize our taxes and we would want to do that at the federal level where it's they're being controlled the production and those are sort of things that we would discuss after we have a feel for what the public wants and the decisions that would be made that way and with the taxation we need to be aware that there isn't expected to be very much revenue coming off of cannabis at the beginning you cannot ex we cannot expect that we will be able to tax it very high and in fact the experience that we have from the federal uh, from the United States at this point is that the price of cannabis goes down very low very quickly we have an immature market at the beginning so you will not be able to to tax high otherwise you'll be back into the black market situation and um, the, our own pub, uh, parliamentary budget officer the federal level has suggested that the, for every dollar you add on tax on the grounds you will drop close to 20 percent of your um, the price will have to go down in order to keep consumption from disappearing into okay. the black market thank you further to that minister Siebert. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, add that uh, nobody's expecting a windfall of tax revenues uh, around the legalization of, uh, of marijuana and as Ms. Buck mentioned it, it's going to be uh, a question of finding a right balance so that there will be some tax on it to perhaps dis uh, discourage uh, uh, increased consumption but not a tax so high that it encourages uh, the black market which of course we already have thank you thank you further Mr. O'Reilly uh, thanks Mr. Cherry I, I, okay I appreciate um, this is complex but I I'm hoping that some element of cost recovery is going to enter into uh, looking at this as well. That's a comment. Thanks. Thank you. Noted. Next, I have Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I do have a couple of um, three more questions here. Uh, one, when we talk about the black market, and, uh, what has what will the government be doing to ensure that? Uh, this product doesn't get to our youth that are under the age of 18. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Siebert. Yes, well, but uh, the principles we wish to discourage the use of those, uh, uh, discourage the use by those under the age of 18 also too, I believe the federal government is going to have uh, some fairly draconian or harsh laws with uh, respect to uh, distribution to, uh, to uh, those under 18. So, um, I mean, there is obviously already uh, use uh, of those under 18. We wish to discourage that uh, use in every way possible. Thank you. Thank you. Further, Mr. Thompson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, I agree with discouraging, but what plans are in place to make sure that, it, besides the federal government and this law, because there's laws out there right now, and I would say it's rampant that you know young people are able to get access to um, cannabis and marijuana and other sorts of drugs from all over the place, especially in the Northwest Territory, it's from down south. So, what is the plan? What are, are you guys looking at? It? Have you developed it? besides just discouraging? I mean, I can discourage you from not drinking a can of pop, but what are our plans so we don't see this huge increase influx? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To that, Mr. Aiken. Um, I don't think it'll be possible to completely prevent all uh, youth from getting access to cannabis. Uh, youth are drinking now, and it's against the law. We, there will be, there'll definitely be public education campaigns. Law enforcement will, of course, be involved because, as the minister mentioned, the penalties for for trafficking cannabis to youth are being significantly increased in the federal legislative package. Um, one of the things that will, what we think is going to come up a lot in the public engagement is what is the retail model we are going to adopt here in the Northwest Territories. And that will also have implications as to how secure the retail points of sale are to, to ensure that youth are not accessing, uh, accessing mar marijuana and so one of the advantages of the Liquor Commission model, for instance, is that they are very good at preventing youth from entering stores and from purchasing product in liquor stores. 
So that is one of the advantages of a model like the Liquor Commission uh, oversight of the liquor stores in the Northwest Territories. If you make it, if you expand to other points of sale, which is something that will be dealt with in the public engagement, it may be more difficult to secure the product within the facility where it's being sold and also to prevent youth from, from possibly buying it in, in those places. Um, we know this can be a challenge no matter what retail model we take. Um, we suspect that across Canada that this issue is going to be dealt with and, and one of the things we can expect is that storefront points of access will do what they can to secure the product to prevent shoplifting, for instance. And mail order systems, it is something that's going to have to be addressed because they're, you aren't dealing with the person, they're not right in front of you. So you have to ensure that the person you're sending the, the cannabis to through the mail is in fact an adult. And there's always the danger that the person who opens the mailbox may not be an adult. So there are going to be challenges going forward. We'll never prevent it altogether, but, but the government here and governments across Canada, including the federal government, are going to do all they can to deal with this issue. Thanks. Thank you. Further, Mr. Thompson? Thank you, Mr. Scar, and I thank Mr. Eckman for that answer. Kind of answered one of the questions I had down here. So it leads to, I guess, my next one. Has the government looking at the potential of this being a product that can be grown in the Northwest Territories and sold a product from the north instead of something from down south? Have you guys looked at this, or will you be looking at this as a potential opportunity besides the four plants that the, each community or individual has? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Siebert. Uh, inter industry tourism and investment is on the working group, so I suppose they they could be looking at that also. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further, Mr. Thompson. Next, I have Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is sort of further to Mr. Thompson's comments. Part of the reason for legalization is to, as stated, to eliminate the black market. So those who are in the illegal drug trade, trade will lose a revenue stream and there's a chance they might make that up by trying to push other drugs uh, a little harder. Has the department contemplated this? Has it been part of the discussions at all? Thank you. Thank you. Minister Siebert. I think we've been in, uh, thinking much about that, uh, that possibility. I don't know if there's much scientific evidence for that. Um, I mean, if marijuana becomes uh, more readily accessible, does that mean other groups will be easy, illegal? Um, Underground uh, groups will be pushing other drugs, perhaps. I guess that's to be determined. It's um, as we've seen uh, of late, the the courts, uh, police and courts, are taking a very uh, severe view of uh, distribution of those types of drugs, and hopefully that would continue and reduce consumption of those types of drugs. I have a feeling that uh, the increased use of marijuana will not make a huge difference in the amount of consumption of those other drugs because they have quite different effects. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Simpson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. My comment was about cannabis as a gateway drug. It was about uh, making up lost revenue streams. Uh, on a different uh, subject, the conversations around uh, uh, with the feds uh, regarding the community's ability to enforce their own bylaws, uh, has this included uh, uh, reserves? Because I know that constitutionally reserves are different than say designated authority or municipality. So have there been conversations around reserves that differ from those of the community's ability to enforce their own bylaws around surrounding cannabis? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aiken. Thank you. Um, the only conversation we've had on that was was with our bilateral teleconference with the federal officials in the, in the cannabis secretariat. And we were discussing the local option possibilities here in the Northwest Territories. And Canada brought up the fact that, uh, that some reservations also have <coughs> bylaws made under the Indian Act that allow them to control alcohol in the community. So they, uh, they acknowledge it's something that they're thinking about at that end. But of course, that's a federal responsibility. So we're, we're hoping that whatever thinking they do, they will also inform us of, because it relates to what our communities may be able to do under under our Cannabis Act if we are en enabled to have local option <coughs> provisions. Thank you. Thank you. 
Nothing further? Anything further from committee? Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what would be your position, or you ha have you had any discussions with the local jurisdiction? Let's take uh, the Del Negotini government, for example. As you know, they concluded self-government here last year, and, uh, and they're proceeding on with uh, implementation. Could, could that government model govern cannabis policy or, uh, or police it and to, to some degree or some model satisfactory to their leadership ambitions with this government? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Sieber. I may need some advice on this uh, from Mr. Aiken, but it would seem to me that um, even those entities that are self-governing couldn't really override federal jurisdiction. They uh, may have the ability to uh, override our uh, uh, jurisdiction in some of these areas. I don't know if uh, Mark Aiken wants to add anything to that. Thank you. Further to that, Mr. Aiken. <laughs> um, I, I would add that this is something that has been discussed within the Interdepartmental Working Group. Um, Executive and Indigenous Affairs is represented on the Working Group, and, and they've raised this issue. Um, I, I'm aware that Delaunay has authority to regulate liquor under the self-government agreement. Um, I don't believe they have yet drawn down those authorities, but I think it's reasonable to assume, and we've talked about this, that that communities and regions that are entering into self-government agreements that anticipate they want to deal with liquor may also want to deal with cannabis. And, and so it, it may change our negotiating mandates with, the, with those communities. So it's something that we're definitely aware of, but I don't think we've made any decisions yet. Thank you. Thank you. Further, Mr. McNeely? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just provide this as a note. Uh, the, I thank, thank you for making this presentation and, and allowing us to present our questions to you because they are going to be very similar that uh, when you have community or regional engagement, similar questions are going to be asked uh, at those round tables. So I, I thank you for allowing us to prepare you before you fly to Delny. Thank you. Thank you. Comment thank you, noted. Uh, Comment noted. Next I have <laughs> Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, um, Mr. Cherry. I'm uh, just thinking ahead to uh, internet sales and uh, I know when it comes to uh, electronics products, certain categories now, even if a Northwest Territories resident wants to go online and buy something um, through eBay or Amazon or whatever, big Best Buy or whatever it's called, um, when they fill out the shipping stuff automatically, there's a, some thing, I've never tried it, comes up that just shows you that you have to pay an NWT fee now uh, because of... Uh, it's not so much the point of sale, but where the thing is being shipped to that determines whether you pay the uh, the fee. What's going to be the the taxation arrangement for internet sales for cannabis? Is it going to be at point of sale? Is it going to be depending on where it gets shipped to, and who gets to keep the revenues, or is that all still up for discussion and negotiation and so on? Thanks. I, I guess. It'd be to our advantage if it's actually where it's getting shipped to, as opposed to a point of sale. But if there's any answers on that, I Thank appreciate you. hearing. Thanks. Ms. Gluck. Good start. Okay, for starters, um, it will depend if we have our own regime here for distribution. We will not have internet sales. That would be the assumption. Okay. Oh, sorry, um, Mr. Chair. Our assumption would be that we have to wait for the public engagement to decide if, in fact, we were having our own regime where we would not have internet sales. If there are internet sales and it's coming, it would be, I'm assuming that we probably would let that be the federal mail order, and that would be what we do nothing, and at which point um, the taxation would be coming off straight from the federal government's taxation um, forms. We could, I'm not quite sure how we would be monitoring that taxation under that circumstance, so it hasn't been contemplated that we'd be doing internet sales. But if we were, it would 
we would definitely be trying to coordinate with the federal government on how we would be handling the taxation. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, um, unless we explicitly um, prohibit Internet sales into the Northwest Territories, it's going to be inevitable. Uh, and I think that's the, the Feds, uh, their backstop actually will allow that to happen. So um, I guess if there's Internet sales into the Northwest Territories, I think we need to make sure that we capture the revenues that, that from those. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Buck. Mr. Chair, there is you have to understand how the system will work. If the federal government has that they're going to be controlling the distribution all the way out to the end. So if there is a case of there will not be a case of being able to sell into the GN, uh, the, the Northwest Territories if, in fact, we prohibit it. So if, for example, we went to a liquor control model, then any producer of the marijuana down the chain would have to distribute, send it to the um, the commission that would be controlling cannabis sales in the Northwest Territories. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly? Nothing further. Committee, any further comments, questions? Mr. Thompson. I asked the question about the prohibition and talking with the federal government. I was asked for a commitment from the minister and to share it with us uh, as soon as they get it. So is the minister able to share that information with us? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Siebert. Um, because of the nature of the negotiations, it may be difficult to share the, uh, all of that information, but I'll, if I could turn it over to uh, Mr. Aiken for some uh, expansion of that answer. Thank you, Mr. Aiken. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad Mr. Thompson asked that question because um, the nature of our engagement with cannabis secretary officials in Canada is an, an, they're given advice on a not for attribution basis. It, we're being collaborative. They're being as, as open with us as they possibly can. And so we wouldn't be in a position to say, uh, Mr. X from the Federal Cannabis Secretary said, yes, you can reduce it to you know, home grow from four plants to two. That's going to be fine with us. Or yes, he's saying that a community could um, could impose our pro prohibition regime. So it will be difficult for us to say what advice we've received from Canada because we'd be violating the principle on which we're um, kind of consulting with them now. Um, I think there will be, we will be able to say we think we'll be able to do this or we think we'll be able to do that, but I don't know what we'd be able to share with, with, the, with, with MLAs or even or with the public about what we're informed by Canada. Thank you. Thank you. Further, Mr. Thompson? Uh, no, that's, that's good. I'm, I'm okay. a little bit disappointed, I guess, because they're going to be asking these questions. And it's going to be something that if we can't tell them, it doesn't really sit well like for open and transparency. Like to me, it is about making sure people make informed decisions and they're going to be given this opportunity to consult. But if we're not able to give them that answer or that information, then it's kind of hit and miss. And it really doesn't inform the people to understand how they can govern their own community and their and how they deal with stuff. So I appreciate the answer and I understand your point of view, but if, if maybe you can push the federal government that we need something that we can share with these communities. I mean, whether it's something generic that, you know, this is what we're doing, but so we can get that information out there. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Comment noted to the comment. Mr. Aiken. Thank you. I, I don't want uh, to leave the impression that we won't give any indication <laughs> at any point about what uh, what we think we can do. I think what we won't be able to say is we've been told by Canada we can do this. What you may hear us saying is we suspect that we will have authority to do this or we suspect we'll have authority to do that. Um, and so you will be hearing from us in that way, but we, we uh, the non-attribution rule is pretty clear in regards to the, this FPP process, and we wouldn't want to violate that. Thanks. Thank you. 
committee. Further comments, questions, concerns for presenters? Seeing none, Minister Siebert, I turn it over to you for any closing comments. Yes, thank you for these uh, these good questions. Uh, this is a very complex uh, complex issue. Uh, looking at the um, distribution and taxation options on on slide seven, as you can see, there are at least uh, at least uh, three possible models. It was interesting in reading the McClelland uh, report that uh, they were opposed to. Uh, marijuana or cannabis being sold in the same location as alcohol, but they were also opposed to it being sold in the same uh, location as tobacco. So uh, that would present us with some difficulties up here, I think. So we really are looking forward to hearing what the public has to say. Then, of course, as the bill moves uh, forward, there's going to be an awful lot of work in a very short period of time for all of us to do. So I'd like to really thank you for your, your excellent questions today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister, for presenting today on this very important subject. We look forward to the consultation rolling out, and we can be adjourned. Thank you.